everyone back. We are um, continuing our study of prophetic texts on Sunday evening, combined with our future uh, hope on Sunday mornings, and combined with our study of Daniel, eschatology during small groups, all with the intent to help us with our eschatology over the next few months. So we come now again to Matthew chapter 24, and the Lord's Olivet Discourse, and beginning in verse 32. Where the Lord says, Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for the, the blessed privilege of studying your word together, and particularly, Lord, this, this glorious text in Matthew 24, where you speak of your coming in the end of the age. Thank you, Lord, for the clarity of these words and the, uh, the wisdom of them and their help to us, and help us, Lord, live in light of them. Help us to be watchful. Um, help us to be discerning. Help us to be understanding here. Spirit of God, we acknowledge our weakness and we need you to help us Lord, with understanding these texts. Thank you for your time. Amen. Now we're in Matthew chapter 24. Our text, specifically verses 32 to 35, the parable of the fig tree. Uh, but as the Lord begins now... Matthew 24, uh, just to sort of set the stage for us and remind us, refresh our memory with respect to where we've been so far. Uh, the Lord has rebuked the Pharisees. He has rebuked the, re the religious elite in Jerusalem. He leaves the temple, the house of God to them desolate. And now he sits on the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem the week of his death, speaking with his disciples. And in Matthew chapter 24, uh, in verse one, the disciples looking at the buildings, showing the Lord the buildings of the temple that they can see from the western slope of the Mount of Olives. Jesus draws their attention in verse 2 to those buildings, and he said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, that was staggering, a startling statement to the disciples. And so it draws questions from them to the Lord. And beginning in verse 3, as the Lord sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him, saying, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Two questions that the, the disciples ask of the Lord. When will these, these, these things be concerning the destruction of the temple, the temple mount, and those buildings that they're looking at? And then what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And as we've worked through Matthew chapter 24, we noted that verses 4 through 14 deal with that time of tribulation that describes the time that we're in. It's the time of the church age, beginning then with the first advent of the Lord Jesus Christ and proceeding through our time even today, where in verse 5, many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ, will deceive many. You will hear of wars, rumors of wars, to see that you are not troubled. All these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. And all these things are the beginnings of sorrows, or the beginnings of birth pangs. They're going to deliver you up to tribulation, the Lord says, and kill you. You'll be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Verse 10, many will be offended. They'll betray one another, will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be, shall be saved. Verse 14 gives us the pivotal instruction during this time, our pivotal responsibility during this time, when the Lord says that this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. This specifically references the church age, our time, and our responsibility to preach the gospel. So we come to verse 15, we have the sign that the Lord refers to in verse 3, or the questions that the disciples ask of the Lord in verse 3. Therefore, the Lord says in verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolation, that sign spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on, him who is on the housetop not go down or take anything out of his house. 
Let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes, but woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. Pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath, for then, verse 21, there will be great tribulation. Great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And here the Lord gives us an overview of that time at the end, at the end, prior to his coming, a time of great tribulation. Now the intent of the Lord to this point in the Olivet Discourse really is to prepare his disciples and to prepare us for what's coming, right? The common exhortation biblically with reference to the coming of the Lord is this expectation of watchfulness, this command for us to be prepared. And again, I'm reminded of the connection of that instruction to the Lord's instruction to his disciples in John 16. Turn to John 16 there with me. Actually, John 15, John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. And the Lord's intent in this is to prepare us for what's coming. We see the Lord doing that in an intimate setting in the upper room with his disciples in John chapter 15, beginning in verse 18. And here the Lord tells his disciples, listen, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember, remember, the Lord says, the word that I said to you. Servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But all these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. Look down at verse, or chapter 16, verse 1. What's the reason the Lord has spoken these things to the disciples? Verse 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. These things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you that when the time comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Uh, these things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. In other words, the Lord is preparing his disciples for what's coming so that when these things come about, they don't think in their minds, right? The Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has abandoned me. These horrible events, these persecutions, these difficulties, the affliction that I'm facing is not an indication that the Lord has abandoned me. But rather, it's an indication that the Lord is in sovereign control of all things that come to pass, even this affliction that I'm facing, right? The Lord is in sovereign control. The Lord is saying, be watchful, be ready, be attentive. These things will take place. They will take place. So be prepared for them. Be prepared in your heart. Be prepared in your mind. Don't be troubled and don't be made to stumble. I'm telling you beforehand, this is what is coming to pass. This is what's going to happen. Right? With the discussion on the Mount of Olives with his disciples, essentially the intention of the Lord is the same. Right? Preparing his disciples for what is coming. The content of or the consistent message of the New Testament with respect to end times, with respect to eschatology, specifically with respect to this age of tribulation in which we now live, is for us to be watchful, for us to be prepared, for us to put our faith and trust in the Lord and not to swerve, not to take a step to the right or the left, right? But to follow Him. Let not your heart be troubled, brother, sister. Right? The Lord is in control. So he tells us this to prepare us for what's coming. Now, we have the Lord's instruction in verse 20, in chapter 24, Matthew 24, with respect to his coming and of the end of the age. And as we come now to the parable of the fig tree, beginning in verse 32, we have a summary parable, if you will, for the discussion that's taking place on the Mount of Olives between his disciples and himself. Right? It summarizes the conversation that's taken place and the overall message, the overall intent of the parable is that you and I would watch. 
that we would be watchful, that we would understand the times, that we would not waver, that we wouldn't falter, but that we would continue following the Lord, continuing trusting the Lord, even when these difficult circumstances come upon us. Now, as we come to the parable, it's important for us to remember altogether the purpose of the parables. And the Lord gives us that in Matthew chapter 13. Turn to Matthew 13 with me. Matthew chapter 13, as the Lord is speaking in parables, the disciples come to the Lord in verse 10, Matthew 13, verse 10, and they essentially ask the Lord, why do you speak to them? Why do you teach them? Why do you instruct them in parables? And so in Matthew chapter 13, verse 11, the Lord answers and says to them, because I speak to them in parables, because... It has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. But, the Lord says, right in verse 16, but blessed are your eyes, for your eyes see, and your ears they hear. For assuredly I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So as the Lord speaks to them in parables, He does so essentially here with two purposes. Even in Matthew 24, verses 32 to 35, with respect to the parable of the fig tree, he preaches this parable essentially with two reasons. One, parables were for helping the disciples to understand an important truth, to reveal an important truth. But secondly, their design, the parables, their design to conceal important truths from the deaf and blind. So I have to ask the question up front, do your ears hear? Do your eyes see? Do you perceive? Here, this parable is for God's people to perceive what the Lord is saying with respect to His coming in the end of the age, right? This parable given to reveal truth here to the disciples of the Lord as they sit together on the Mount of Olives. Specifically in our text, that truth concerning the end of the age. Now, in our text, verses 32 to 35, the Lord Jesus Christ is still answering their questions from chapter 24, verse 3. Specifically, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And so the Lord then, in answering their questions and bringing a summary of their conversation to this point, He commands His disciples with an imperative, a command, in verse 32. The Lord says, now, learn this parable from the fig tree. Learn this lesson. Right? It's important to understand this. Pay attention. Get this. He says, I'm going to give you an example from our context that you can clearly understand. I'm going to give you a word picture. I'm going to give you an analogy or a metaphor, so to speak, that will make complete sense to you if you apply it rightly. And then I want you to apply that clear sense, apply that clear meaning to our discussion regarding the sign of my coming and the end of the age. We're to take the analogy, to take the word picture, and apply its understanding to what the Lord has taught regarding His Olivet Discourse, the end of the age, and His coming in Matthew 24. All right? Learn this parable from the fig tree. Now, they would have well understood fig trees. Unlike many of us today, I know nothing about fig trees, other than what I can read on Wikipedia. Right? That, and that's about it. And that was earlier in the week. Uh, how they grow... The conditions in which they grow, many of us know nothing about them in that respect, but the disciples knew a lot about them. They knew a lot about fig trees. It was a staple crop uh, in Israel during the first century. 
They know when the, pear, when the fig tree blossoms, when the fig tree produces fruit. They know the conditions under which the fig tree produces fruit. They know what they need to do to the fig tree to get it to produce fruit. They knew a lot about fig trees. This would have been extremely common to them. It would have been a clear metaphor, a clear analogy that they would have well understood. So the Lord says to them in verse 32, there at the end, considering the fig tree, when its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Now, based upon the very common observation at that time that the twigs or the branches of the fig tree get tender as they fill with sap just before summer... And based upon the tree's newly budding leaves, you know, disciples, you know that summer is near. That tenderizing of those branches filled with sap, the budding of the fig tree, the leaves coming in, was clear and irrefutable, inarguably connected to that tree soon to produce fruit and the coming of summer. The coming of summer, you know that summer is near. Seeing a fig tree in that, connect, in that condition would raise expectations of summer, where there would be soon ripe figs on the tree, a time when there would be an expectation of a harvest of figs, a harvest of figs, right? When you see its branch has already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. Look at verse 33. So you also, here's the analogy, right? Here's the connection. Just in the same way that you understand that from the fig tree, so you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Know that it is near at the doors. Now the first question we have to ask then in verse 33 is what is the Lord referring to by it? Right? Know that it is near. Now, considering the parable of the fig tree is a, a sort of summary, if you will, a summary parable to the Lord's discussion with his disciples about his return and about the end of the age, it, in this context, is referring to the perusia, the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you see all these things, Christ's coming is near. Christ's coming is at the very doors, right? The next question then. We're looking at verse 33, and we want to understand the connection of the parable to what the Lord is teaching. The next question we have to ask of our text in verse 33 is then, what does the Lord mean by all these things? All these things. The statement there, that statement, all these things, doesn't make sense if the Lord is referring to verses 29 through 31 when he's describing his own coming. Right? It doesn't make sense. When you see the Son of Man appear... You know that the Son of Man is near. It rhymes, but it doesn't make sense to interpret it that way, right? It's illogical. When you see the Son of Man appear, you know that the Son of Man is near. Now, it doesn't apply to verses 29 to 31. It applies to the verses that precede that. Considering, again, that this is a summary parable, wrapping up or summarizing this conversation that the Lord is having with His disciples, it's best to see all these things in verse 33 as referring to those events or circumstances described by verses 4 through 28. By verses 4 through 28. Those events that begin with a time of tribulation. Right? A time like birth pangs that increase in frequency, that increase in severity, ending in a time of great tribulation, where in verse 15 you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Right? Where in verse 24 you see false Christs and false prophets rise and show great signs and wonders. Then know, when you see all of these things from verse 4 through verse 28, you know that the Son of Man is near at the very doors. At the very doors. Right? And first, note this with me. This does not mean... That the signs of the great tribulation given in verses 15 to 28 pinpoint the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? You can't take out your calendar or your abacus or your computer and figure out from the signs given 
verses 15 to 28, exactly when the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ is. Although we may observe the signs given, and we in this generation may observe the signs given, look at the reality of verse 36. Verse 36 says, Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. It hasn't stopped people in history from guessing. Right? In their sense, they're, they're believing, they're presenting facts in many cases. It doesn't give them cause to sit or pause from making their speculations about this time. But verse 36 is clear. Of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Secondly, it also doesn't mean that the nearness of the Son of Man can only mean a doctrine of imminency. In other words... That the return of Christ is the very next thing on the prophetic calendar. Doesn't necessarily mean a doctrine of imminency either. All these things and the nearness of the Son of Man described as at the doors does not necessarily lead to a doctrine of imminency, but a doctrine of expectancy. Right? The New Testament frequently refers to being expectant, to be watchful, to be ready. That it could come at any time to be watchful, right? We are to be on the watch with the expectation that the coming of Jesus Christ is near, is near. And that expectation has been the case since the first century, right? Since the Lord was having this conversation with his disciples, once the Lord departed from them by means of the cross and ascended to his father, the expectation is that he will soon return. Look over at Philippians chapter 4 with me. Philippians chapter 4. We see this in a subtle way presented by Paul in Philippians chapter 4. Look with me at verse 4. Right, since the first century, there's been an expectation, a doctrine of expectancy, so to speak, an attitude of expectancy that the Lord would soon return. Philippians chapter 4, look at verse 4. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Same word there, right? Same word as at the doors in Matthew 24. Same word, at hand. We see that throughout the New Testament, this expectancy, this attitude of expectancy with respect to the Lord's return. Now speaking, back in Matthew 24, speaking of an attitude of expectancy... And what is to be expected at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want you to notice something else with me about the parable of the fig tree. Look at verse 32. Matthew 24, verse 32. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know it, that it, the coming of the Lord is near. At the doors, the Lord is at hand. When the fig tree puts forth leaves, you know that summer is near. What takes place for fig trees immediately or shortly after summer? What takes place is the harvest. Figs are harvested. Harvest in the Bible is often associated with judgment. Judgment specifically at the end of the age. Turn back with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. Harvest often associated in the Bible with judgment or the end of the age. If you look at Matthew chapter 13 and drop down to verse 36. 13, 36. So then Jesus, in verse 36, sent the multitude away and went into the house. And his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age. And the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out His angels. They will gather out of His kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. And then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Look over at Mark chapter 4. 
Mark chapter 4. And again, we see the same connection here between harvest and the end of the age, or harvest and judgment. Mark chapter 4, look at verse 26. And the Lord said in verse 26, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle, because the harvest has come. And a parable of the kingdom. Look at Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14. Again, same connection made here now at the end of the age. Revelation 14. Look at verse 6. Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every tribe, nation, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him for the end of His judgment has come, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, The beast and his image, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Right, we see that sickle in Mark chapter 4. This is an instrument of harvest, right? An instrument, in this case, of judgment. Another crying in verse 15 came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap. For the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So he who sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. So this use of the sickle, this connection of the harvest to judgment, Jude describes it this way. He says, Behold, when the Lord comes, the Lord comes with ten thousands of his saints to execute judgment on all. To convict all who are ungodly among them of all their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. This connection right to the parable of the fig tree that will be setting up or setting the stage for what follows in Matthew 24 regarding a judgment text there on the Mount of Olives. The Lord Jesus Christ speaks to them of judgment in verses 36 through 44. Just sets the stage, sets the stage for that. Furthermore, if you look at our parable, verse 34, the Lord continues. He says, assuredly now, assuredly I say to you. He emphasizes the importance of what he's about to say. Assuredly I say to you, verse 34, this generation will by no means pass away Till all these things take place. Now this generation, it's given commentators trouble. It's given me trouble. <laughs> it's given us trouble understanding exactly what's meant here. And there are several different options that can be taken with respect to its interpretation. This generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. But one option is this. It means the disciples' generation. Right? The generation in which those disciples are living, that generation alive at that time would not pass away until all these things. And again, the reference to all these things, verses 4 through verse 28. Verse 4 through verse 28, 
all these things will by no means, um, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. It gives us difficulty. It gives me difficulty because all the events described in verses 15 through 28 have not taken place yet, right? The abomination of desolation has not taken place yet. The greatest of all periods of tribulation, verse 21, that one is still future, right? Cosmic signs and the coming of the Son of Man have not taken place yet, right? If you take this interpretation, you're essentially pressured to take a purely spiritualized interpretation of those events, specifically in verses 15 to 28. It doesn't seem to me to be the most acceptable view of the text, right? Second possibility is this. This generation, verse 34, is used to describe the entire period of the church, the church age, from the first coming of the Lord Jesus Christ to his second coming. And the weight of this argument being the use of the word generation for extended time periods, principally in the Old Testament, where this generation is used to describe the generation of the flood or the generation of the wilderness. And again, a compelling argument, but often in the Old Testament, when generations are used, that word is used, it's used in the plural to refer to multiple generations, not in the singular. It just doesn't seem to match up well with what the Lord is saying in verse 34. Matthew chapter 24, 34, in that case, would be describing then the generation of the church or the generation of the church age. And this generation of the church will not pass away until all of these things take place. Compelling argument, but it just doesn't seem to carry the most weight. The third possible interpretation of several seems most plausible to me, and that's this. When the Lord says this generation in verse 34, it simply refers to those people alive at the time that the fig tree begins putting forth leaves, right? The generation that is alive when they see the leaves budding, the generation that sees the abomination of desolation, the generation that witnesses the signs and wonders of false Christ and false prophets. In other words, that generation or the generation that witnesses all those things will not pass away until it all comes to pass, right? This generation will by no means pass away until all these things take place. All these things, again, the coming of the Son of Man, the end of the age, the gathering together of His elect, and the glorious consummation of all these things, right? That generation, when they begin to see those signs, that generation, alive at that time, will not pass away until all of those events take place. In other words, what's being communicated here is that it's a short time, right? When that sign, the abomination of desolation, is seen in Matthew 24, verse 15, From the time you see the sign of the abomination of desolation in verse 15, it's a short time before the coming of man, right? Before you see the Lord Jesus Christ coming in the clouds of heaven. That generation alive at that time won't pass away before all those events, all of these things come to pass. So in answer then to the disciples' question concerning when he will come and when will be the end of the age, Jesus says that it will happen very soon after those signs are witnessed, before the generation that sees them passes away. The generation alive, when these last signs occur, do not have to wait long before the Lord returns, right? Verse 34 then, Assuredly I say to you, this generation, the generation that sees all these things, will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Meaning, the time in which all these things take place is short. They take place in rapid fire progression. Something we'd expect, right, considering verse 22. The Lord says in verse 22 that unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. Well, they are shortened, right? Shortened such that the generation alive at that time will not pass away until all those things take place. But for the elect's sake, the Lord says, those days will be shortened. Shortened to the degree that that generation will see them. In other words, it's a... Again, fueling a doctrine or an attitude of expectancy, of expectancy. The generation that witnesses those things may be the generation that is alive now. I tend to think so, right? Maybe the the generation that's alive now. It fuels an attitude of expectancy, an attitude of watchfulness. The Lord then ends his brief parable and synopsis, the summary with words referring to the authority and the veracity and the permanence of his everlasting word in verse 35. Heaven 
and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. And the grass wither, withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Watchfulness. Watchfulness. What's important for us to remember? Watchfulness. Be ready. Let not your heart be troubled when you face persecution. Be ready. Don't sleep while your master tarries. Be watchful. Be ready. Be about the Lord's work. This is going to fuel or add to our interpretation of verses 36 to 44. Of that day and hour, the Lord says, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this. That if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready for the Son of Man is coming in an hour you do not expect. Who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his master has made ruler over his household to give them food in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his master when he comes will find so doing. Assuredly, I say to you that he will make him ruler over all his goods. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming and begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour that he is not aware of and will cut him in two and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And such will be the fate of all those outside of the Lord Jesus Christ, right? Cut in two and apportioned, a place in torment, a place in hell with the hypocrites where they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. If you're outside of Christ, turn from your sin and put your faith and trust in Him, right? For brothers and sisters, God's people, be watchful. Be about the Lord's work. And let's glory and revel in looking forward to our glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for this exhortation, God. Thank you for these commands. Thank you for this clear picture, this clear analogy of the fig tree. And help us, Lord, to live with expectancy of your soon return. Help us to be watchful. Help us to live for you fervently during this time, preaching the gospel. Preaching the gospel such that when you come and gather your elect from the four corners of the earth, you will receive the full reward of your suffering and be glorified. You'll be praised and worshipped for all eternity to the great joy, rejoicing of your people. We look forward with great anticipation to that day. Thank you, Lord, for this time together and study of your word in Jesus' name. Amen.